This is the BBBC. And now, a change to our advertised program as the Barefoot Backpacker discusses the feelings about returning home after a long vacation. Be aware that this pod may contain elements of whiny self-indulgence that some listeners may find grating. Hello, and thank you for downloading. You're listening to Travel Tales from Beyond the Brochure, a weekly series looking at unfamiliar places across the world, an aspect of travelling you may never have thought of. I'm your host, Ian Oliver, also known as the Barefoot Backpacker, a middle-aged Brit with a passion for offbeat travel, history, culture, and the whys behind travel itself. So join me as we venture Beyond the Brochure. quite a while since I've done this. Hopefully you're still interested in what I have to say, though I quite understand if you aren't, or you've got distracted and don't have faith in me anymore. I've been away for a while. If you ask me, I should have arranged all of this a bit better. After the previous podcast, which I actually published after my first night on my trip, I had an adventure for about 11 weeks, mostly in places that didn't have internet access. Now, you'd have thought this would have been the perfect opportunity to write and blog, and indeed I did do a lot of this, though not in the sense of writing a podcast. I did do 10,000 words of my never-to-be-published fantasy adventure novel, though, so, you know, swings and roundabouts. Eleven weeks away. OK, uh, I started with two weeks in New Zealand. It's not a country I'd been to, perhaps surprisingly, and I went in the height of winter, which meant it probably wasn't a typical visit. I was going to do a park run in Hamilton in the first days I was there, but it started at 8am, as opposed to the 9am starts in the UK, and at 8am it was about 3 degrees Celsius. There was frost on the ground one of the days I was there, and that... Coupled with not having running shoes and the surface not being barefoot friendly, I was otherwise going to run in thick walking socks, regardless of how silly that sounded, uh, meant that I uh, <clears throat> didn't. I hadn't even intended to go there at all, other than using it as a stopover, but inconveniently the twice-weekly flight to the island of Niue, where I had wanted to visit, departed about 40 minutes before my flight from Dubai arrived, and the flight on the Saturday was ridiculously expensive probably because it was New Zealand half-term school holidays. So I ended up staying in New Zealand and exploring a bit of the North Island. Now, I don't know how many of you have been there, but my main impression of the scenery of the North Island of New Zealand is, imagine you're a child, or if it's easier, imagine you are your own children, and that you've been given the task to paint the countryside. What do you draw? Rolling bright green hills, blue skies, maybe the occasional sheep and farmhouse? Well, New Zealand's North Island is a lot like that. It looks like a primary school pupil has drawn England, even down to the shades. It's simple, pastel and pure. I have to say I spent most of my time there drinking craft beer and eating pub food. The beer was alright, not as good as the USA, if I may be so bold to say, but still drinkable. Of the major tourist draws in the North Island, I didn't go to Hobbiton, because I'm British, and if I wanted to see scenery like that, I'd go to the Peak District, which is only 15 miles from my house. Plus, I've never seen the films, so it wouldn't really mean a lot to me. I've read the books, obviously, and I also lived for 12 years in and around Birmingham, where Tolkien got his inspiration from. So to me, the Shire is, um, Solihull, basically. And I used to live in Mordor, so obviously your mileage may vary. But one day I'll do a blog post about this very point. Not that Cradley Heath and West Bromwich are big tourist centres, but I've never let that mither me with my blogging before. I did go to the Glowworm Caves at Waitomo, though, one of the most tourist-centric things there is to do on the North Island. That said, I went on a group trip with Spellbound to two of the lesser-visited cave sites some way out of the village, which was much more relaxed and interesting than going through the main tourist track. I actually had time to save the lights, which looked like stars on the cave roof. It's a really odd experience, actually. We were taken to two caves. The first involved a walk quite a way inside. The second had a boat ride really deep into the heart of the cave. Because it was such a small group, I think, 12 of the people, a majority of which were made up of two Indian families. It was a much more chilled experience, and we had the chance to take our time. If you think maybe New Zealand is a bit mainstream for me, be restful that my next 26 days were spent in the island nation of Vanuatu. What do you mean, where? It's true that it's not a place that many people know about. Even Brad guides, the guidebook connoisseurs for places that no one else touches, don't do a guide for it. 
This is possibly more because they don't have a market in Australia and New Zealand than anything against Vanuatu, and Vanuatu is mainly made up of tourists from those countries, and France. I asked them. In case you don't know, though, it's about three hours north of New Zealand by plane, and a little less east of Australia, Cairns, though the planes flying to Brisbane. It's made up of about 80 islands, of which 65 are inhabited, though Ambai, population less than 1,000, was recently completely evacuated due to an ongoing volcanic eruption. The total population of the country is around 270,000, which makes it slightly larger than my nearby city of Derby. My next podcast will be a specific one on Vanuatu, probably, as it's certainly worth talking about more than just a brief overview. Suffice to say, I achieved a long-standing ambition to climb a volcano. In fact, I climbed three on two different islands, none of which was the most famous one, and did a multi-day hike for what may have been the first time. Much of the terrain of my many hikes on Vanuatu Islands were through jungles and rainforests, which proved an adventure in itself. Note that despite your initial imaginations when I say that, Vanuatu has about as many dangerous animals as the UK. There were huge spiders blocking the way, but they were all perfectly harmless, according to the local guides. And in any case, they were all carrying machetes, so I felt safe. Or as safe as anyone feels on an island that practiced cannibalism within living memory being surrounded by guides carrying machetes. It's a fabulous country though, it's pretty friendly, and it's been regarded as the world's happiest country in recent years. It's fairly simple for an English speaker, though as a dual English-French colony, which itself caused some, shall we say, issues, French is still reasonably understood in certain parts of the country, and indeed most of the few backpackers I met there were French. And it's pretty simple to get around, usually because there is literally only one way to get between two points. This is often a chartered 4x4. This leads to the unusual situation where kilometre for kilometre it's often cheaper to fly than go overland. Most of the time though you don't actually have a choice because there are no direct flights between, say for example, the two main airports on Malakula and one road. But on the island of Ambrin, there are direct flights, one a week in each direction, but no roads that link the two airports. Most of my accommodation was in guest houses, half board cottages linked to people's houses in small villages. They were generally pretty basic, even electricity was limited, and drinking water was usually restricted to the village tap, often fed by rainwater. Needless to say, this explains why in my 26 days there I had internet access for maybe a total of about 8 hours. It's very much a place to go to get away from it all. What that meant, of course, is that, as previously noted, I kind of lost touch with everything I was supposed to be doing, like this podcast. After Vanuatu, I spent three weeks in Australia, visiting a couple of friends I'd known for a while. It was a pretty busy time, and again, mostly in places where the internet was mm, a little slow and dodgy. That said, I had a good time exploring, from a very bogan wedding in the sticks of the wilds of Queensland, to being videoed by my friend Shelley walking through fields of wildflowers in the countryside of Western Australia. That I was meeting friends there is important. I've got a bit of a love-hate relationship with Australia, or at least the Australia that most people visit. Being British means I grew up with the strong influence of Australian culture. Indeed, at one point in the 1980s, it was possible to watch over 10 Australian soap operas on TV in any given week, which my grandmother used to do. Not to mention Australian actors, comedians, musicians. Of course, there's also the cricket. England-Australia was the high point of the schedule, and everything built up to these biennial contests. There's also the fact that many Brits have family and friends over there, so it's a place we're constantly reminded of. Going there means walking down streets that look so familiar, similar names, types of shop, public transport systems, obviously the language. So going there just feels like I'm less like I'm going on holiday and more like I'm taking a trip down the road to my house. A very long road, I'll grant you, but it doesn't feel like a foreign country. It's basically the UK, but hotter and slightly more racist, though we are catching up on that point. So sometimes... You know, meeting friends there feels like the only reason I should be going there, otherwise there doesn't seem to be a lot of point. Obviously at some point soon I'll need to visit the other Australia, which will definitely be very different. But because a lot of that will be people-based, it's something I've always kind of shied away from. I always feel awkward as an interloper, an obvious foreigner in someone else's culture, especially when I'm travelling solo. Almost like, I shouldn't be here and you all hate me being here because of what my people did to you and because you think I'm just here to gawp. Maybe one day I'll do a pod on that issue as well. Anyway, moving on. My trip ended, via a full day in Singapore, with 12 days in Sri Lanka, which, let's be honest, I visited ex almost exclusively for the food. And it was definitely worth doing, the gorgeously nibblish dosa rolls at breakfast, the endless small dishes of curry at lunchtime, and the traditional kotu in the evenings. Lush. I didn't really do else, a lot else while I was there. Well, I went to a couple of temples and historical sites, but that was about it. I mean, to be fair, the overpowering temperatures didn't help. It was about mid-30 Celsius pretty much all day every day, and that made me somewhat melty. 
My last two nights were spent in Colombo in a hostel with aircon, which was the best end to a trip I've ever had, believe me. For pretty much all the journey up to then, my rooms had had simple fans in them. The place I stayed in Jaffna also only had one electric point in the room, so I could either have the fan on or charge my phone, not both. Fortunately, there was enough of a social area in the lobby for me to do the necessary. Arriving back in the UK felt very much an anticlimax. For a start, it was weird to be wearing shoes again. The only time I wore shoes in Sri Lanka was the day I arrived, the day I left, and even both of those were only because it made my hand luggage less obviously outside aircraft weight tolerances to wear them rather than to stuff them in my bag, and for a couple of hours on the middle Monday morning where I failed to climb a mountain. Just outside Sigiriya is the summit of Pidurangula, which I've never really pronounced properly. Uh, which apparently has great views across the countryside and is considerably cheaper to climb than the rock in the centre of Sigiriya Historical Complex. The trouble is it's a much more scrambly climb and I couldn't quite make it up the top on my own. I'd have needed a couple of hands up, I'm not good with heights or things that require balance, but in any case the viewpoint almost at the top revealed the countryside to be, as is normal with me when I climb hills, covered in haze. So in my head I'm justifying my failure to climb it as being, well it wouldn't have mattered anyway. In total, I was away for, what, 11 weeks or so, mostly travelling solo and often in places quite different from home. So obviously coming back home was always going to be a bit of a culture shock, but there's a couple of other things to consider. Firstly, remember that I don't have a standard 9-to-5 style job to come back to anymore, so I don't have this double-edged sort of routine to settle myself down with. Also remember that I've rented most of my house out, so the building itself no longer feels like home. So, in a sense, it still feels like I'm pretty much away. I think this is what you might call reverse culture shock. I'm finding it hard to settle, to be honest, and while I've got so many things to be doing, so much admin to do, I'm finding it hard mentally to get into that groove. My mind still feels like it's belonging far away. Talking about this anticlimax feeling that I've got back in the UK, I asked a few of my Twitter friends about it, whether they too had experienced it, and this is what they said. I experienced some real reverse culture shock. Uh, The first time I went to India in 2004, I was there for only three weeks and I was travelling with my then boyfriend. Uh, We both agreed we'd been struck by culture shock on our first day in Delhi. We were staying in Parganj and it was very noisy and we we just thought we'd ended up in in a different universe. But um, it turned out to be even more difficult when we returned home. Uh, On the airport bus, well, back into Stockholm, we were just sitting there staring blankly out the window at each other and repeating to each other, you know, it's it's so quiet and clean here and how are we going to live and things like that. Inga Olaz there, she's a friend of mine from Sweden, and she was telling us that culture shock can hit even after a short trip, so my feeling after 11 weeks seems perfectly understandable in context. Laura Lundell, who, as you'll hear, has spent years out of her home country, the USA, makes a couple of interesting observations. Not least that you can get this kind of culture shock even from places similar to home, so being in places very different just makes it even more contrasting. I've lived abroad a few times, the most different experience being when I was with the Peace Corps in rural Senegal. And every time I've moved back to America, certain things have stood out to me as a bit of a shock, especially after coming home from Senegal when literally everything was a shock. But the theme that stayed the same, the one thing that has consistently weirded me out each time I've come home from wherever it was I was living, is how spread apart everything is in America. Having grown up here, I never appreciated how large the country is. It was just the norm. But after living in Germany and England and Senegal and China, which, yeah, is geographically similar, but damn, there's a lot more people, allowed me to appreciate just how big America is. Like, when I came back from Senegal, the amount of land a single family owns really struck me. In Senegal, like in my village, 30 people might live on the same amount of land that my dad's house sits on. And mind you, my dad lives in a two-bedroom house. It's a small house and a small yard. But Americans have yards. And when I came home from London, I was freaked out at how far apart all of our businesses are. In England, one block will have 10 businesses. Here, one block has one business. Maybe two. I forgot how much open space America has. And it's really cool to be able to see your home country with new eyes. We don't just travel to learn about faraway lands, we also travel in order to better understand our own. When I think of reverse culture shock, there are two things which really stick out to me. The first one is how easy it is to get things done. I can go order food at a restaurant, I can interact with people at the gas pump, I can understand everything so easily. The other thing is, I sometimes feel like I'm eavesdropping on other people's conversations. 
For example, I go take my kid to the playground and I hear a mom talking to her daughter and it's weird because I'm not used to being able to understand what other people are saying and now I, I can't understand and so I just feel like I am, uh, you know, maybe listening to something I shouldn't be. So it's quite funny. Sean Rand of Our Travelling Zoo there also mentioning picking up on the little things that you might not have thought of when coming back after a trip. And it's very true. Uh, sometimes I'll pick up on car registration plates, but it's these little things. They're not something I often notice. There's also the matter of returning to the home itself, as the following couple of people do talk about. Whenever I've returned home from a long time away, I can't help but feel flat and a little depressed. It's like I've changed so much during my trip, but... Everything around me is exactly the same. It's exactly as I left it. I think as travellers we like to romanticise about the idea of home and the things that we've missed, but often the reality is that it isn't as good as we'd remembered and we're just left realising the reasons that we left in the first place. Travelling light there, remarking about returning home after a trip not being the perfect place you remember it being. It's a feeling that seems quite common as Highlands to Hammocks, which is a great name by the way, also reflect upon. So um, returning back to your childhood home and feeling like a stranger there is just a feeling that we're, we're all too familiar with, to be honest. Yeah, we, um, we've both lived away from home for long periods of time and every time we return home, we still just feel like a guest. It doesn't really matter how much your parents try and make you feel welcome, like, we still feel like we're a guest in our own home. Yeah, and like that feeling just really makes us want to leave again and look forward to the next adventure and get back on the road. It's definitely something I can relate to. Sometimes what used to be home becomes more of a physical location than a place with feeling. But to end with, I want to go back to my friend Inga, who raises one positive aspect of reverse culture shock. I think that's probably the point where the travel bug really bit me, because I couldn't really imagine not travelling after that. I very rarely get um, the reverse culture shock thing uh i think maybe it's because i have a job to return to and you know routines are good for me but also because i know that job uh, is one where i can take time off i can go traveling again right now though reverse culture shock is a strange feeling for me the inability to cope with life back in your home environment having spent so long away out of it and doing completely different things than you would at home you know like wearing shoes don't knock it, it may be a small thing, but it's a metaphor, a symbol of my not travelling. And my feelings are exacerbated by my situation of not really feeling at home anyway. Everything around me is familiar, but my own passage through them is not. I think part of my problem is that I lack direction. One of my hopes for the trip was that I could use the time to think about where I felt my life should go in this post-corporate lifestyle I now lead. But to be honest, I was having too many adventures to worry about it. And even when I did think about it, I always managed to find something else easier to distract me. And so it has been since I came back. There's so much I've needed to do, but I've always found ways not to do them. Honestly, sometimes I wonder what the point is. I'm not a well-known or well-respected blogger. I'm not photogenic, and my time with Shelley in Western Australia proves I also don't have great vision for a good photograph or the patience to make my photos pretty, so I'll never be a cutting-edge Instagrammer. I'm also really blasé about promoting my blog itself. I'm not in any way a salesman and never have been. So even doing something constructive with that feels beyond my reach at times. Plus, there's the very nature of what I write about. I'm quite niche. I don't write the clickbait-driven, Pinterest-friendly posts around 12 things to do in insert major city here. For one thing, I tend not to blog about major cities, because everybody else does, and I have nothing constructive to add. For another, and I've said it before, but I write a bit like a history textbook. I don't talk about things to do or talk about a place. And while there's a oh dear, place for that, be thankful I'm not a fisherman. You couldn't cope with the puns that would ensue. The cut and thrust of social media likes isn't generally it. And why does that matter? It doesn't, except that businesses tend to only look at the number of likes and followers someone has rather than the content of the post. And as a side issue, one of my major issues with Instagram is people who post a pic of themselves in some really nice place, but then caption it with a trite travel quote, and that's it. That tells me nothing. It tells me nothing about who they are, where the picture was, a very important characteristic of a post, I find, especially on Instagram. Nor does it help me explain why they chose that picture to post. All it says is that they're more interested in themselves. Don't get me wrong, it's not about the selfie. Indeed, I like seeing pictures of people in them. It helps me relate to the image and imagine myself there. 
It's about the lack of information about, well, anything. And yet these accounts who post these get hundreds of comments and thousands of likes. And while I know that many of them have bought followers, not all of them have. Yes, I'm aiming for a particular market that they're not. But some people just look at numbers, it seems. Sometimes it's hard to get out of bed in the mornings. Sometimes it's hard to sit at the computer and do stuff because of this feeling in my head that it's all for naught. And this is exacerbated by a problem of being easily distracted by anything, really, especially if that anything requires less effort. My old boss where I worked uh, described me as being like Scrat from the Ice Age films, just always chasing a, a nut around, not worrying about anything else. And that's a very good description of me, I think. I'll get up in the mornings with sometimes good intentions, but as soon as I turn that computer on, I find things that I can do before I get down to doing what I should do. A couple of hours later, I'm still no further forward with anything, but I've probably learned a great deal on Wikipedia. Sometimes the only way of getting things done is to physically go out and put myself in a position where I force myself to write. This is usually a pub. There are a couple of downsides with this, as you can probably imagine, but it's easy to see why many artists, writers and poets especially, uh, become bankrupt drunkards. Still, you can't take it with you, eh? It's also better than the alternative of sitting around doing nothing but endlessly waiting for new tweets to appear or people to post new images on Instagram, wondering if anyone would actually even miss you if you disappeared entirely without telling anyone. And I'm honestly not sure many would. I don't really talk a lot about mental health because I've never really felt that mine was as bad as my friends. I'm not on any pills, I've never been diagnosed with anything, so I've never really felt like I'm in a position to talk about it. Occasionally, I wonder if it would be better if I were. Probably Ritalin. There's also the matter of routine, which I briefly alluded to earlier. Most of the previous adventures I've had have been less than three weeks long because they've been taken in the context of my having a full-time office job with, to within an hour either way, regular working hours. This meant that even if I arrived back at home on the Sunday afternoon tired and weary, by the subsequent Wednesday it was almost as if I'd never been away at all, and the trip itself felt just like a distant memory. It was therefore easy to distract myself from the culture shock, partly because I was never away long enough to really forget about life back in the UK, partly because my adventures were, by necessity, quite fast-paced and intense, so I never had the chance to really acknowledge the differences, and partly because by getting back into the routine so quickly, everything quickly returned to normal, for a given value of normal, so the returning shock never had time to kick in. Now I'm eh, a freelance travel writer, really the term's slightly embarrassing as I've never done any, a fact that's in the back of my mind as a potential future problem by the way, and may mean that I have to return to the mundane office job at some point in the next two years. But it does sound like a more grandiose and respectable job title than influencer. I don't have this routine and pretty much every day feels like a Saturday. And because my days are very similar and involve being distracted by Wikipedia, Instagram, Twitter, and, shall we say, one or two other websites, I have plenty of time to be affected by these feelings. That all said, in a more lucid moment, I created a to-do list the other day for the first time in a long time. Most of the items were to do with my blog, writing posts for it, promoting it, finding different ways of getting people to see it, that sort of thing. A couple of them were related to plans for the coming months. Later in October, I'm going to a sort of festival called Yesterville. Their tagline is, say yes more, and it's full of people who have direction. I'm hopeful I can find a few like-minded souls and or pick up some inspiration when I'm there. Then, at the start of November, I'm going to the World Travel Market in London. While more of a B2B event with tour operators, tourist boards and the like, it provides an opportunity for freelance travel writers, hmm, like me, to go and speak to interesting and interested people with a view to working closer with each other going forward. I'm very much more interested in working with tourist boards than anything else. The sort of places I go and the sort of writing I do aligns itself much better with them than it does with product placement, hotels and the like. I have other long-term plans too. My friends have suggested previously that I ought to get out of my comfort zone more. One of them even suggested I do things involving water because, you know, that's an obvious place for a non-swimmer to be. I mean, to be fair, that was their entire point. Plus, a recent Twitter poll I did about which of the three things I can't do that everybody else can, driving, cycling, swimming, was most important to learn. A whopping 63% said swimming, which confused me as I'd have expected them to have said driving, but still. I have issues around water, uh, and maybe one day I'll need to face the fears and learn. There's quite a few places in the world it seems barely worth the expense of going to if you can't swim, and thus taking advantage of fabulous diving and snorkeling opportunities. Kiribati, for one but I'm honestly not sure this is quite the time. 
Rather, I plan to tackle head-on my introversion and self-confidence and improve my language skills by going to somewhere in Latin America, Nicaragua, El Salvador or Bolivia, any recommendations would be useful, and force myself to learn Spanish on site and intensively for maybe six weeks or so. Because I'm easily distracted and I have no self-discipline, it's very hard for me to do things like language learning off my own back. I literally have to be forced into a position where I have to speak for me to do it. My French friends will confirm this. Despite being able to get by in French, it's so easy for me to fall back into English where I can that I do. One of the takeouts I did get from both my long trip and my time since coming back is that I've realised I'm not the social pariah I always make myself out to be. Yes, I love travelling solo, but I've realised it's really nice to meet up with people every so often, either long-standing friends or just new people who appear randomly. In Kandy in Sri Lanka, for instance, I was just about to leave a restaurant when a solo backpacker called Alexa walked in and started talking to me. My plans had been nothing more to go back to my guest house and fail to blog, but we ended up talking for a few hours and even went to what passed as a pub. Uh, she's on Instagram as Alexa Eve and is pretty cool. Just don't ask her random trivia questions or to turn the lights on. It's that sort of thing that makes me realise what I miss when I travel, and indeed live, solo. In a future pod I'll talk about solo travel more, the benefits and malefits of it, but I think I'm slowly changing. As long as I can go back to a room on my own and have my alone time, I'm fine, but I've realised that sometimes even I get lonely, which is quite hard when you come back to a town where you pretty much don't know anyone because all your friends are fellow travellers or people you've known for online for years who live in distant towns. And doubly so when you realise that your town is quite small, and for many of the people who live here, an adventurous trip into foreign parts involves getting the bus to one of the neighbouring towns, or, if you're feeling really daring, across the county border, which is about two miles from my house, by the way. Well, I think that's enough wittering from me, so let's move on to my regular feature of Lesser Known Destination of the Week. Lesser Known Destination of the Week I really need to change that jingle, it's quite nerf. The thing is, it's a long way down my to-do list. It's just one of those bits of admin that isn't strictly necessary. It's just a nice to-do, and thus it never gets important. Anyway, I've been thinking of doing uh, a little on this town ever since I went there. It's Hamilton in New Zealand, a couple of hours south of Auckland, and one of those places that pretty much everyone who goes to the North Island will have been through, maybe even stopped for a while to change coaches at, but may not have really given themselves time to explore it. Let's be honest, my introduction to the town was lunch at a brew pub on the main street. In my defence, I'd just been on planes or in airports for a shade over 25 hours, and I was desperate to chill. It's set in a pretty location. Defining the centre is the Waikato River, the longest river in New Zealand, and one of the thousands whose name is self-defining. Waikato means flowing water in the local Maori language, and equivalent in the UK would be the ooze. Unlike many towns built on a river, though, it's hard to notice unless you specifically look for it. The reason is it's kind of in a small valley lined with trees. It's a very pleasant walk along it, and you certainly don't feel like you're in the country's fourth largest city by population, about 165,000 people. Along the path, there's points of interest, including quite a few places important to Maori history. And Maori history is mentioned in more detail in the Waikato Museum on the edge of the high street. It's free to enter, donations are always welcomed, and on my visit had on display a huge walker tower, a 200-year-old Maori war canoe, and royal flagship called Te Winica, which was used in the wars with the British. It's now being repaired and restored to its former glory. I can't seem to find out how big it is, but for comparison, some of the bigger end walker uh, can be around 30 to 40 metres and operated by about 80 canoeists. Te Winica, it's not quite on that scale, but it must certainly be about 20 metres long. The museum also had a display about World War I, including Maori reactions to it. Some tribes actively opposed the war on grounds of colonialism and anti-governmental protest. Others, particularly around Hamilton and the Waikato region, were quick to sign up, and indeed an entire battalion, the Pioneer Battalion, was formed and fought at Gallipoli. A part of World War I, incidentally, I knew almost nothing about until I arrived in New Zealand. History education is very self-centred, I find. You only learn stuff about national interest. The biggest drawer of the town, though, is probably the large gardens. Spread out over, what, half a square kilometre? I'm really bad at visualising area, but it's basically 54 rugby pitches, or a quarter the size of Monaco. It's not simply a big lawn with flowers, nor is it a botanical garden with flowers from all over the world. Rather, it's about the concept of the garden itself. It's divided into several zones, with each zone having different types of garden laid out within it. To take an example, one of the zones is called Paradise, and it takes you on what is effectively a history tour of the concept of the garden, having replicas of, for instance, an 11th century Chinese meditative garden, laid out to maximise views over the river, complete with bridge and pavilion bedecked in reds and greens, 
It's all got a representation of Italian Renaissance garden full of grid lines, archways and statues of ancient Roman mythology. And there's a late 19th century traditional English garden filled with flowers that wouldn't look out of place in your favourite period drama. Other zones look, include one that looks at sustainability, from traditional Maori ideas to Western kitchen gardens, which these days would be more seen on allotments, and a zone that takes the concept of the garden and pushes it to the extreme, for example, manipulating the environment to allow tropical plants to grow in a cold setting. More will be added to this zone in the future, including a surrealist garden and a picturesque garden with a fake history. This sort of thing was all the rage in the 18th century, apparently, when people would build ruins in their gardens. A talking point over the after-dinner drinks, no doubt. The site used to be a rubbish dump and lies a couple of kilometres southeast of the town centre, conveniently past a very nice ice cream shop. However, possibly the most famous spot in the city is a small statue surrounded by a bit of iconic street art. On the former site of a cinema on the main street is a statue of the actor Richard O'Brien, these days of course most notable for playing the voice of Lawrence Fletcher, the father in Phineas and Ferb, but here seen in his guise as the character Riff Raff from the Rocky Horror Picture Show, with artwork on the walls and a couple of buildings reflecting the show. While this may seem strange to most, O'Brien lived in this part of New Zealand for much of his childhood and indeed has now been granted dual citizenship, and the cinema in question was where he used to go to watch sci-fi movies in the late 1950s. I'm far too old to follow suit. I'm also probably far too old to look dashing in a 1970s fantasy spacesuit, though I'm sure there are some fetishes for that. Well, that's just about it for this week. Next time I'll almost certainly be doing a special episode about Vanuatu, whilst it's in my head at least. The originally scheduled pod following up from my previous episode, all around whether the duty of travel writers is to be honest or to be positive, will be broadcast probably sometime in November, when I've <clears throat> written it. Until then, have a good week, and if you're feeling off colour, keep on getting better. Thank you for listening to this episode of Travel Tales from Beyond the Brochure. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't forget to leave a review on your podcast site of choice. I'm pretty bad at that sort of thing myself, so I'll understand perfectly if you don't. Travel Tales from Beyond the Brochure was written, presented, edited, and produced in the Kirkby and Ashfield studio by the Barefoot Backpacker. Music in this episode was Walking Barefoot on Grass, bonus, by Kai Engel, which is available via the Free Music Archive and used under the Creative Commons Attribution 4.0 International Licence. Previous episodes of this podcast will be available on your podcast service of choice, or alternatively, go to my website, barefoot-backpacker.com. If you want to contact me, I live on Twitter at rtwbarefoot, or email me at info at barefoot-backpacker.com. Until next week, have safe journeys. Bye for now.